From the CISO series, it's Cybersecurity Headlines. Security chiefs fear CISO scapegoating following Uber's Sullivan verdict. U.S. airport sites are targeted by Killnet. And your next threats, finger heat and drone-delivered pineapples. These are some of the stories that my colleagues and I have been bringing to you on this week's Cybersecurity Headlines. And now we'll get a chance for some insight, opinion, and most definitely some expertise on these stories and more from our guest, Matt Honea, the head of security at Smart News. Matt, thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Rich. Thanks for having me. Really happy to be here. Before we move into our discussion, of course, we have to thank our sponsor, No Name Security. Learn how to secure your APIs. Remember, you can join us on YouTube Live. Just go to CISOseries.com, hit the events drop down, and look for the cybersecurity headlines week in review image. It's the third one down if you're counting. Just click on it to join us. We're not going to wait for you to follow those instructions, though, because we've got about 20 minutes. Let's get into it. First up here, security chiefs fear CISO scapegoating following Uber Sullivan verdict. CISOs are split on whether Wednesday's conviction of Uber's former security chief, Joe Sullivan, will have more wide-ranging consequences for people in their position. According to the record, some fear the case will prompt more CISO whistleblowers in the future, while others feel that security chiefs should be prepared to be held responsible for incidents that they're involved in. A federal jury convicted Sullivan of two charges related to his attempt to cover up a 2016 security incident at Uber, where hackers stole the personal details of 57 million customers and the personal information of 600,000 Uber drivers. Matt, you know, should the buck stop with CISOs when it comes to these incidents that they're, quote, involved in? Or is this an unfair assessment? I know this is a really involved case, but curious what your thoughts are. Yeah. So, you know, I think CISO scapegoating is going to be dangerous. Um, You know, this is... This is going to be quoted for a long time. Um, I think it's really going to start some needed discussion in the industry. Um, we need to find, you know, if any, if nothing else, you know, just finding the right CISO for the industry, I think is going to be one of those discussions, uh, making sure that you have the right person for the job, not just a butt in the seat. Um, and, um, you know, I think as far as the CISO responsibilities go and, um, you know, being that scapegoat, go, I think CISOs need to be one of the loudest voices in the room, especially when it comes to security. I don't think they should make the decision by themselves. They shouldn't, you know, go lock themselves in a room and and figure out the right answer and and come to it and say, aha, you know, this is uh, fast moving events require a lot of fast decisions. um, But it really is super important to make sure that you and those those executives are all aligned. Um, You know, I will say one thing that I've seen very helpful in the past is um, just having executive tabletops being prepared before um, these types of things happen so that you're not scrambling at the last minute. Yeah, and uh, we've been covering kind of the ins and outs of this, so it, it seems like this will be the end of it. But uh, you know, to your point of whether this sets precedent, uh, both for you know how how CISOs go about doing their job, does this you know add lag to the decision? Uh, we we will see that maybe cited going forward. We'll continue to cover it as it's relevant. Our next story here, and and the one I'm just going to put the hard on right away: finger heat can leak your password. Researchers at the University of Glasgow School of Computing Sciences developed a system called ThermoSecure. It's designed to reveal a computer's password with heat signatures. It uses cheap consumer thermal imaging cameras with a machine learning algorithm to look at a keyboard to reveal recent key presses. The researchers found that using the algorithms, they could achieve up to 86% accuracy if captured within 20 seconds of input. This does fall to 76% accuracy within 30 seconds and 62% after 60 seconds. Shorter passwords, though, were easier to guess. If you had six or less characters, it was guessed 100% of the time. Now, you may say, who has a password six or less characters? Well, if you're looking at a pin, mm-hmm. that definitely is under usually under six. So, Matt, you know, cynics might scoff at a timeline here. Talking about 20 seconds is not a huge window when it comes to, you know, needing to measure heat. But there are circumstances where this would be enough. Talking about security keypads, ATMs, uh, with anyone being able to basically have a, a pocketable, you know, these these thermal cameras can fit on a phone now. It's just, you know, to click over USB. I'm curious, what's your take on this? Yeah, you know, I think uh, we can just all wear gloves. We can all ice our fingers. You know, that should be uh, <laughs> one of the best ways to stop this attack. Um, you know, I, I don't think passwords are going to go away anytime soon. Um, I think thermal cameras have been around a long time. This is not a um, not a new attack. Actually, I would say probably one that's slightly more successful is the invention of high definition cameras with high zoom lenses that uh, can yeah. capture passwords with high fidelity as well. Um, you know, I think thermal is another. I you know, it, we often don't think about it uh, as much. Uh, 
you know, 30 seconds. Actually, I think we could probably make that longer if you put a little special tape or some paint maybe over the keys. You can Ooh. capture the heat longer and maybe even, you know, make that attack more successful. So, um, you know, I, I think it's uh, it's definitely an interesting read. Um, my hope is that uh, I can withdraw the, you know, money from the ATM with uh, with retina scanning at some point. So, um, hopefully, you know, that'll that'll change change the landscape of, uh, of how we even think about, you know, regular old pins, uh, passwords, uh, you know, once we get to that retina scanning. Yeah. Yeah. This is one of those stories where it's like the unintended consequence of just like tech hitting commodity prices, both in terms of, you know, something able to run an AI algorithm on basically, you know, any desktop computer or, or phone even at this point. And yeah, the the, the ever uh, availability of, of thermal cameras. So, so uh, uh, good stuff. I, I, I'm, I'm always... Tickle my fancy. So I'm glad we covered that. <laughs> Next up here, U.S. airports t sites targeted by Killnet. The pro-Russian threat group claimed it orchestrated large-scale DDoS attacks against the websites of several major U.S. airports. This intermittently took several sites offline, including those for Hartsfield Jackson Atlanta International, LAX, and Chicago O'Hare, among many others, preventing travelers from accessing airport services or getting flight information, though the attack did not impact actual flights. This follows Killnet's recent expansion into targeting U.S. organizations. Last week, it ran DDoS campaigns against government sites in Colorado, Kentucky, and Mississippi. So, Matt, I mean, DDoS attacks might not have impacted the flights directly, but these things mm -hmm. have a way of amplifying around the world, given the way flights and connecting flights are timed. Any kind of delay there even doesn't get canceled. Uh, if it causes travelers to be late to the gate, that could have Im large impacts down the road. Do you feel that we as a country are doing enough to assess and protect these types of seemingly lesser attacks? This feels adjacent mm -hmm. to critical infrastructure. Should we do more? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so my thought is, you know, in general on the DDoS attacks, um, generally they start off very, very strong. So once we see a DDoS attack that hasn't happened for a long time, you get all of these botnets, they're all targeting, uh, you know, infrastructure, and eventually they get found out. And then eventually networks start to block them. Eventually we start having blacklists and those DDoS attacks actually get less effective as you're trying to reuse them on new attacks. So I, I think, you know, is it going to get worse? I mean, it might get worse in the sense that there's going to be new targets, but I actually think the, the overall infrastructure uh, is going to get uh, reduced. Um, I think for um, critical infrastructure, absolutely. I think we need to be prepared. I think airlines uh, or, or anything, pipelines, whatever it might be in our critical infrastructure should be prepared for DDoS and have that as part of their plan. I think for sectors uh, maybe outside, like the non-critical public sectors, um, I just don't think that they're going to be able to, to resource and, and fund prevention against DDoS attacks. Uh, they're obvious, they're, they're generally expensive. You have to have, you know, expensive solutions. And I, I think there's a lot of other low hanging fruit they're going to focus on. But, you know, I do think that they should have contingencies ready if they do happen. I think there's always, you know, ways to switch over redundancy servers, you know, things to, to help mitigate that. But I, I don't know if we're going to be able to prevent it uh, at scale. All right, our next story here, Android leaks traffic even when always on VPN is enabled. Mulvad VPN has discovered that Android leaks some traffic every time the device connects to a Wi-Fi network, even with always on VPN features enabled. Data being leaked outside VPN tunnels includes source IP addresses, DNS lookups, HTTPS traffic, and also likely mm. NTP traffic. The issue uh, stems from a design choice in the Android operating system to allow special use cases, such as identifying captive portals, things like hotel Wi-Fi, that must be checked before a user can log in or use split tunnel features. Android users are likely unaware of the issue due to Android's inaccurate documentation related to VPN lockdown features. Mulvad had contacted Google, requesting them to add an option to disable these connectivity checks. This kind of appears to be a bigger story than a lot of the coverage uh, ha has put out there. Would you agree that these types of small cracks in the levee can lead to bigger problems once cyber criminals kind of figure out a way to weaponize them? Is this is this something that the public should assume Google would be able to fix or, or you know, Android would be able to fix? Yeah, uh, you know, I get this story. I think it's really important. I think the people who actually need to read this story will probably not read it, unfortunately. Um, you know, the, the real people here that are affected are the ones who need privacy at all costs, journalists, whistleblowers, whoever it might be. 
Um, and, you know, they, they put a lot of faith into always on VPN. I mean, when I hear always on VPN, I, I think it's, you know, I would guess that it's always on, <laughs> you know, not on some of the time or on for part of the traffic. And, you know, having that design choice to, you know, allow you to connect to open hotspots before the VPN connects, I get it. I, I think it needs to be very clear, especially when you talk to, you know, Apple or Google or any of the, the folks who are, are big in the space, they need to be really transparent about what this means. So um, that, that's my two cents on this. Yeah, I, I almost think it's a way of like the law of unintended consequences, right? Where they were testing this feature and they they rolled it out to a bunch of people. Hey, everybody turn this feature on, not necessarily targeting, you know, getting journalists or something like that. And a bunch of people complained, hey, when I went to Starbucks, it didn't, uh, or, or, you know, it was at, at the Hilton, it didn't connect automatically. And they're like, oh, here's the very simple, it it may, like as an engineering choice to to resolve the user complaint makes a lot of sense. But yeah, when you have that security, you know, that, that can't miss security, uh, definitely. Uh, an issue down the line. All right, before we move on, we want to spend a few moments with our sponsor for today, No Name Security. Gartner predicts that APIs will become the top attack vector for web applications in 2022, but many organizations don't know where to start. To help you get prepared, No Name Security is hosting an API security workshop for technical professionals to learn how to protect their environment against API attacks. By attending, you'll also earn CPE credits to help maintain your CISSP certification. To learn more, visit nonamesecurity.com slash workshop. Digital license plates legalized in California. California has ended a pilot program and fully legalized digital license plates for private and commercial vehicles. These e-ink digital license plates, also known as R-Plate, are manufactured by California-based company Reviver. It can reportedly function in extreme temperatures, has some customization features, and is managed through Bluetooth using a smartphone app. R-Plates can be equipped with an LTE antenna, which can be used to push updates, change the plate if the vehicle is reported stolen or lost. It'll actually just say stolen on the plate, so I guess you can't get that vanity plate anymore, and notify vehicle owners if their car may have been stolen. Sounds... Very 21st century idea, kind of like a heads up display or self parking technology. Matt, any problems you see inherently with with this technology? Hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, I think the first question when I read this was, uh, you know, who who pushed this in the first place? Um, it, it seems <laughs> like <laughs> trying to solve a problem that wasn't necessarily a problem to begin with. Um, I think you know, just reading about it. Um, I think there's a lot of points of weakness. I think having Bluetooth enabled, for example, allows your car to be tracked. I mean, look at all the major tracking little token things like, uh, what are the air tags and things like that? All Bluetooth. Mm -hmm. um, ISM, uh, IMSI abuse, you know, if it's connected to the cellular net network, other ways to track that. Um, you know, if they can push a, a command that says stolen, can an attacker also push a command? You know, remote in, put your car, make your, your car stolen. That would be a headache. Um, if a, if a police officer walks up on you and um, <laughs> asks you about your license plate, uh, can you say, oh, my license plate was broken? Uh, I, I don't know if that excuse would fly uh, or go very far. So, um, yeah, all, all thoughts there. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously, you know, I, I think if the, the person or the company that created this, uh, you've got to trust them with all of your data. Uh, so, I think... Yeah. I say this as an e-ink fan. I want e-ink in all aspects of my life. Uh, I love the technology. I, I, I don't know who, yeah, to your point, who was clamoring for like LTE connected license plates that are infinitely more breakable and hackable than a piece of metal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like that, you you really have to show me the value add for that to, to justify it, but it's rolling out. Um, so I guess uh, if you, uh, you know, if you play the license plate game, look out for your California e-ink license plate going forward. <laughs> Next up here, RSA conference reveals CISO board relationships. The RSA conference executive security action forum, top 10 forum in my book, released a research report on Wednesday that describes how CISOs are communicating risk, accountability, security, maturity, and metrics to boards and the challenges that these can sometimes entail. Among the findings are the fact that there is debate among the CISO community about the types of metrics used in board reports and that there is still a failure to communicate completely between these levels, at least as a national average. You know, Matt, 
this topic may not sound exciting as Bluetooth controlled license plates, but miscommunication between IT and the board sets the stage for much worse things to come, especially, you know, when the hack hits the fan. I'm curious, what are your thoughts? Hmm. Yeah, um, I think CISO board relationships are growing, uh, both domestically and internationally. You know, I work for an international company, uh, and um, I, I don't think there's a, a lot of prior guidance. Uh, you know, you don't have that huge, super long uh, history of, you know, CFOs, for example, uh, of how they report. And so CSOs or CISOs are, are finding their way. Um, I think it's really important for the CISO to build relationships across the organization, uh, most importantly with the CEO, but also with engineering, with IT. Um, and really ensure that goals are properly aligned from the beginning. I, I think the worst case scenario is to find out in a board meeting, find out way too late uh, about an issue that just wasn't discussed prior. Uh, so really, I think it needs to start from the beginning. And I think it needs to start with from the culture within the company. Um, you know, I think it, the board and the execs need to be supportive of security because it really takes a lot of folks to get things done. Um, I, I think as far as the metrics are concerned, um, you know, I think there's a lot of debate. I, I actually think it highly depends on what industry you're in to have a, um, you know, a metric that speaks to the board. Uh, but one thing I can agree to, I think uh, roadmaps are, uh, and presenting a clear picture uh, is really important, uh, I think, in all meetings. All right. Next up here, first exemption from U.S. chip equipment ban. Earlier this month, the U.S. Commerce Department announced further export bans on advanced chip-making equipment to China. This impacted technology up to a decade old and would have made manufacturing DRAM difficult in the country. The memory chip maker SK Hynix confirmed it received a one-year temporary exemption from the new U.S. rules. This will allow SK Hynix to supply its own China-based facilities without additional licensing requirements from the U.S. Commerce Department. It's expected for the U.S. to grant further exemptions uh, to other DRAM makers like Samsung. They may have, in fact, already received them. They just haven't confirmed them yet. We've also seen reports from the Wall Street Journal that Yangtze Technologies, a state-owned Chinese uh, memory chip maker, is seeing key suppliers pull out uh, be able to supply that technology to them. So kind of two sides of the coin there. Matt, there's nothing quite mm. like exemptions from a ban to give a supplier the warm and fuzzies and maybe everyone else in that industry chills. There are, of course, good reasons for providing the exemptions, but what damage might this cause uh, either politically, economically, or even from a security standpoint? Yeah, Rich, I mean, I love talking about geopolitics. Um, I, I think... Uh, <laughs> I think shaping the uh, the geopolitical uh, landscape is is a totally different thing. But you know, I love reading about it, and um, I think you know, it, it's kind of like a uh, it's almost like a war, you know, that that's not really um, you know fought with in the ep economic space. And stopping at you know some some country X from having X um, is it super time consuming. I think it's gonna you know it, it works short term. How long can it last? Um, you know, I, I think even with these bans, it's like putting a barrier in the road. It, there's always a way to get around it. Um, so I, I think it'll come down to, um, you know, I, I think weaponizing this is going to be risky. Um, I could see this actually come back and harm the U S in the future. Um, I, I, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if I want to speak to, you know, <laughs> exactly uh, you know, all the environments and everyone at play. But but I do think, you know, th this is a short term story and a, a very long term problem. Yeah, it's it's interesting in an age where from a security perspective, we're more aware of than ever of things like supply chain attacks when it comes to software, that that is very much the the, you know, for whatever cold conflict is going on now between the US and China, that is very much the uh, the area which uh, where at least the US seems very comfortable uh, playing as well. So it just just kind of an interesting parallel to what we've seen in the security space for sure. Yeah. All right. And our last story here, how Wi-Fi spy drones snooped on a financial firm. Modified off-the-shelf drones were once demonstrated as a proof of concept at Black Hat. They're now actually a thing. Congrats. According to security researcher Greg Linares, an East Coast private investment firm spotted unusual activity on its international Atlantean confluence page that originated from within the company's network. The, the call was coming from inside the house. The company's security team responded and found that the user, the user whose MAC address was used to gain partial access to the company Wi-Fi network was also logged in at home several miles away. This led the team to the roof where 
a modified phantom drone was a pineapple device used for network penetration testing. At least that's according to Linares. The Matrix drone was carrying a case that contained a Raspberry Pi, several batteries, a GPD mini laptop, a 4G modem, and another Wi-Fi device. It landed near the building's heat and uh, ventilation systems and appeared to be damaged, but still operable. So, you know, uh, let's just run down all of our uh, technology of the dystopia here. We have our digital license plate, but what else is there to do but drop a pineapple on your competitors from your personal drone? William Gibson would be proud. What does your CISO spidey sense tell you about this, Matt? <laughs> the old pineapple drop. Um, <laughs> <laughs> classic, classic yeah, drop. Cla- Classic drop. Um, it's funny because I, I do think, um, it, I mean, this isn't a new attack. Pineapples have been around a long time. Uh, oh, yeah. but, you know, because it has a drone, because it's got a bunch of, uh, of other electronics, 4G modem, all that good stuff, uh, you know, it gets, it gets a little bit more attention. Um, you know, I, I think from a security standpoint, um, that physical layer, that physical network layer, even if it's wired or Wi-Fi, um, a lot of people don't think about, you know, how far those Wi-Fi networks do extend outside the building. Everyone wants super good signal coverage, um, really good range. They want to roam anywhere in the building um, and they expect, you know, Wi-Fi everywhere. And I think, uh, you know, the default is just to turn up the power as high as possible. And you do get some leakage. And I could see that, uh, you know, that, that's something that uh, was probably uh, done incorrectly here. Um, I, I think it's a fun story. I, uh, you know... Not earth shattering. Um, I think, you know, having that temporary solution, I think finding it must have been really, really interesting. I think this will probably appear in a movie at some point. Like, you know, it's kind of the thing that you, you see out of uh, spy thrillers. Um, <laughs> yeah. I guess my, my, my advice would be, um, you know, I don't know if they needed to use uh, a super expensive drone to get that done. Um, I think it probably could have been done in other, other ways. But uh, yeah, super interesting read. It beats, I guess, the uh, the pineapple catapult that was probably used in the last <laughs> example of this. But uh, yeah, um, yeah, don't burn your DJI drone, malicious actors. You can you can use cheaper stuff, please. Those things are expensive. Uh, <laughs> all right. Well, before we get out of here, was there any story that was a thumbs up or an eye roller for you? Just something you reacted strongly to? Yeah, I, I like the Wi-Fi one, the last one. I know you know we, we ended on it. I think it's a good blend of both physical and network layer security. Um, you know, it's, it just speaks to me based on my own experience. I, I worked in, in wireless security for a long time. So, um, yeah, I liked it a lot. Well, thank you so much, Matt Honea, the head of security at Smart News. Where can people find you if they're so inclined? Uh, just take a look at my LinkedIn uh, or my website. And uh, yeah, that, that's the best place. Fantastic. Well, Matt, this was phenomenal. Thank you for all of the great takes. Uh, we really appreciate your time. We'll have to have you back. Uh, before too long. We also want to thank our sponsor, No Name Security. Learn how to secure your APIs. A reminder to join us next week for Super Cyber Friday. Our topic of discussion will be hacking customer trust, an hour of critical thinking about what are the elements required to build a confident business relationship. That'll be followed by the Week in Review show. And in the meantime, you can get your daily news fix through cybersecurity headlines. Give us about six minutes every single day. We'll get you all caught up. And now, just a reminder, you can subscribe to the show through a newsletter, our newsletter on LinkedIn. You can read and hear the show. They're all in one stop. Just head on over to the CISO series page on LinkedIn to subscribe. Until next week, I'm Rich Straffolino reminding you to have a super sparkly day. Cybersecurity headlines are available every weekday. Head to CISOseries.com for the full stories behind the headlines.